Brothers and sisters, I'm very appreciative of the opportunity to be here at Rick's College and to be here this afternoon with you. I'm mostly impressed with you. I'm impressed with those of you I had opportunity to shake hands with. I wished I had opportunity to shake with all of you. I made that mistake one time saying that in the Marriott Center. <laughs> And I stayed for about an hour and a half or two afterwards shaking hands and ended up having about a week where I couldn't use my right hand. <laughs> but I hope that you would feel the love that I bring from President Benson, from the other brethren, and surely from President Sister Christensen, who dearly love each of you. I couldn't help but think, as the President was saying, we have eight children. I used to say we have eight children up till now. My wife's been telling me lately to not say that anymore. <laughs> just to say eight. One time we were down in Prescott, Arizona not too long ago and we'd gone to one of these family restaurants because you can only afford to go to one of those real cheap places if you have a family that big and it was a cafeteria style and they had started through the line. I was the last one and there was just two people in the restaurant managing the best I could see a girl about 18 or 19 who was at the cash register and the owner who was maybe 50 or 60 this girl, she watched these kids come by, one, two, three, four, five. She kept going like that as they'd come by, and then she'd look down the line to see if there were more yet. And finally, by the time I got to the line, I could see she was really unsettled about it, but she was not brave enough to say anything. So finally, I paid the bill, and we went and sat down just 10 or 15 feet from where they were. And then she and the manager began whispering. And I knew they were talking about us. So finally I said, and there weren't too many people in the restaurant, may I help you? <laughs> and then he was a little embarrassed and I said, do you have a question you wanted to ask us? And he said, well, as a matter of fact, I do. He said, are all of those children yours? And I thought a minute, I said, well, no, those are just the ones I brought with me today. <laughs> And my older teenage boys said, Dad, cut that out. Quit clowning around. <laughs> but I am pleased to think of my family. Today is my 25th wedding anniversary. The only thing to make this sweeter is if my good wife were able to be here. I had last weekend free, and we had a great weekend together with ten of us. <laughs> and I might add, with her alone for a good part of one of the days. She sends her love to you as well. Brothers and sisters, I'd like to direct my remarks to you about something that to me is very important. And if you're going to understand it well in your heart, it will require you to be prayerful. It will require you to listen with the Spirit in your heart. And I would ask each of you to have a word of prayer for me and for each of you that the Lord might speak into your heart this afternoon and bear witness to you that what I say is true and perhaps help you to be more committed inside to do the things that Lord would have each of us do who are gathered here today. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about being not being discouraged. And if you, I notice many of you, and I commend you for that as I shook hands, have paper ready to make some notes. Write some of these things down because they'll be of help to you as you prayerfully think about them. I'd like to talk again to the subject of how to not be discouraged. You know, I found when I was a missionary, and some of you, many of you who are here have been on missions, I met quite a few that I had met in the field just shaking hands for the five or ten minutes we were there. Know that if you diagrammed your discouragement in your life, especially when you're younger, your age perhaps, my chart might have looked like this. This would be one day, and this would be the next, and the next, and the next. Some of you like that? Kind of a wild ride, isn't it? Some days you feel like you can take on the whole world, and the next day you may feel really discouraged. Be honest with me for a minute. How many of you have been discouraged in the last month? Did you raise your hand? Be honest. <laughs> well, now, some of you who thought you were the only one maybe won't feel that way. How many have been discouraged in the last week? How about yesterday? How about even a little bit this morning? <laughs> well, that's a pretty common ailment, isn't it? 
I'd like to read to you a passage of scripture that comes from Moroni, chapter 10, verse 22, that as the Lord tends to do in the scriptures, he gives us the root cause of a problem. And there are many, many branches to it, but the root of it always comes back to that which he says is the root cause. This says, this is verse 22. And if you have no hope, you must needs be in despair or discouragement. And then this interesting phrase, and despair or discouragement cometh because of iniquity. That's a pretty strong statement, isn't it? Some of us might say, well, I'm not iniquitous. I'm keeping the commandments. How come I'm discouraged? I think what the Lord's telling us is we have not gained total control over our body and our appetites and our passions or over our mind or the way we think about things. And thus, because we're not doing it in full faith, in love of God, in truth, there is some iniquity in that, that we have not perfected ourselves in controlling this tremendous mechanism, our body or our mind. So the root cause, in truth, comes back to our not learning yet how to do some things, to be in good control. I said when I was in the mission that I found that discouragement kind of going like this sometimes, or when I was younger, I guess I should say. The older I've gotten, my graph would look more like this. It's mainly on the incline now, and some days are not as good as others, but they're not very deep troughs anymore. And I think one of the great lessons that helped that come about for me was this thought that maybe will help some of you today. Sometimes I used to wait until I was a little discouraged to try to get out of being discouraged. And that's a bad mistake. What you need to do is learn a pattern that if you will do it every single day, you'll very, very seldom ever be discouraged. And again, I used to wait until I was in trouble, meaning discouraged, and then try to get out of it. The key is to learn to do some things continually every day, and then you won't be discouraged. You keep your mind focused on the Lord, and then that hope that he talked about, faith and love will instill in you the courage to go forward. I'd like to talk to you basically about four things that relate to what a person can do in my mind, and there are more than that, I'm sure, but these four have been of great help to me and maybe will be of help to you in some things to continually do, a pattern, if you will. Maybe you can write that word down. A pattern of how to keep from being discouraged. And I would just say before I even try to talk to these four that the bottom line is the antidote to what we just read in Moroni. It's having the Spirit of the Lord with you. If you can have the Spirit of the Lord with you in abundance, my dear friends, if you can learn how to invite this Spirit of God to accompany you and be close to you and you be close to Him, you'll find it very difficult to be discouraged because the fruits of the Spirit are things like joy and peace and hope and faith and happiness. And when we don't have those feelings, it's evidence the Spirit is not upon us very strongly. And thus again, if you want to have those feelings, you must have the Spirit of the Lord. I'm going to mention this first one now in just one minute. I want to say one more thing before I do. I've found as I've had opportunity to be with many college students, those some have gone on missions, some yet have not, some who are married, some who are not, that this is quite an interesting time when you're launched in college. You're kind of free to make a lot of choices and you find out very quickly how deeply you really believe the gospel whether because dad and mom are not here now, do I get up every single Sunday and go to Relief Society or to Priesthood, or can I skip once in a while? My dad and mom used to always have scripture reading. Do I do it now at college, or am I too busy? Do I sometimes skip over my prayers? And in those very simple things, when we're given freedom, which you all have now, to determine pretty much for yourself what to do, again are found the seeds of great hope or discouragement. Let's talk about those four for a minute. Number one on my list would be prayer. To truly be centered in my prayers on the Lord. I won't ask you to raise your hand here. I've, I wouldn't be appropriate perhaps in this audience, but I think that I know most of you enough to know if you would be a typical group of young Latter-day Saints, that there might very well be half of you here who this morning did not kneel alongside your bed and make your first good morning be to the Lord. And I would suggest to you, my dear friends, that you commit in your heart that if perhaps you were not one who prayed this morning or maybe prayed two or three times already today in your heart 
and will kneel at your bedside tonight before you go to bed, if maybe you have not done that regularly as you should. Perhaps you might feel impressed to commit inside to the Lord that that will change in my life. Because of the short time we have in delivering a talk to so many, we can't delve into that any, but you know this to be true. The scriptures are full of that admonition. I'm impressed if you want to just make a note. In 3 Nephi chapter 18, verses 15 to 21, if I remember correctly, the Lord says six times in a row, and that's pretty impressive, six times in a row, you must pray or Satan will get you. You must pray or he'll, his agents will capture you, as it were. What way? Well, for example, talking about discouragement, these darts of the adversary that the scriptures talk about, he's quick to say things like, come on, John, you've got to be kidding. You know you can't get a B out of chemistry. Best you've ever done is a C. To think you could even get an A is beyond what you can do. You're not up to it. You were never very smart in math, Betty, right? And he can begin to lance those darts, if you will, that cause you to not believe in yourself or to say, I'm too tired tonight, I'm not going to pray. I'm just too busy. I, I'm sorry, but I just can't read tonight, Heavenly Father. I've got other things I've got to read. I've got a big test tomorrow morning. And thus we slip by a few very basic things that would keep us very close to the Lord. And then comes discouragement and someone wonders, why am I so discouraged? Prayer, my brothers and sisters, has great power if you do it humbly. It will cause you to be repentant. It will cause you to draw closer to the Lord. Let me tell you a quick example of something that happened in my family not too long ago in which I learned a great lesson from one of my children. One of my boys, this has been a couple of years ago now, maybe, or a year and a half ago, he came home from school and he was kind of discouraged, to say the least. He was down. He caused some contention and problems with one of the other children in the family and caused some pretty heavy activity that night. Have you ever done that at your house? Yeah, I think some of you have. Well, he was. And Dad and Mom kind of counseled together. We thought, no, let it blow over. Tomorrow will be a new day. Let's not confront it. It'll blow over. Well, the next morning at breakfast it worsened and he took on one of his sisters. and again caused some contention and brought him not a very good spirit in the house at breakfast time. When he was preparing to go to school, I grabbed him by the arm and because I know some of you know some of my children, I'm going to call him by a false name. I'll call him John. John? I took him by the shoulder or by the arm and said, come on son, before you go, let's go in here a minute. Took him in the bedroom, shut the door, locked the door, and the two of us knelt down to have a word of prayer. And the dad prayed the best he could for the Lord to bless him, to soften his heart, whatever his problems were, and worried about a big test he had, that the Lord would help him if he would humble himself and have faith and trust that the Lord could do it. And it wasn't more than a minute or so in the prayer, and this young boy's heart was softened. And as soon as I was finished, he said, Dad, let me pray. And then he poured out his heart, told the Lord he was sorry that he had caused some problems at the house, that he was worried, and he told the Lord what he was worried about. And then felt the Spirit of the Lord envelop him to testify to him it was going to be okay. Because he humbled himself and prayed to the Lord. Well, he went off, as you'd imagine, had a great day. The reason for telling you that story is not that as much as what happened after. About a week or two later, Dad got up in the morning. Dad was at breakfast causing some problems. <laughs> He wasn't responding quite the way he should and something happened that he was out of order in what he said or did in the in the morning there at breakfast and when breakfast was over this same son again I'll just call him John he came up got me by the arm and said hey dad <laughs> come here a minute and uh, it didn't dawn on me what was going on until we were in the bedroom and he shut the door and he locked the door <laughs> and then I heard a good boy who was 16 at the time kneel down and Pray the Lord that the Lord would bless his dad, that he knew I was worried about some big meetings I had to conduct and some talks I had to give. And in essence, call down the Spirit of the Lord upon his father. When, I was, when he finished, of course, I was humbled then, and I prayed the same for a good son. And we embraced each other afterwards, and the love that was there was, of course, greatly enriched. And why? Because of prayer to the Lord. I went to work that day, had a tremendous day. 
I honestly forgot about that encounter in the morning until I was back in the garage that night with this same boy waiting for me in the garage and said to me as I got out of the car, Dad, how'd your day go? And I told him what a great day it had been, that my concerns and worries were not founded, and that things had gone well, and that the Lord had blessed me and loved him again, threw my arms around him for his having prayed for me. And then he said, with great confidence, I already knew your day went well. And I said, how did you know that? Well, Dad, I prayed for you either 16 or 17 times today. I prayed for you every moment I could think of it in my classes, in the cafeteria, even in the restroom. He said, I just kept praying that the Lord would bless my dad. Brothers and sisters, I bear witness to you there is great power in one who will humble himself before the Lord and pray to God every day, many times in the day. Pray over your studies. Pray the Lord will bless you to understand better. Because my testimony to you is if you'll humble yourself, even in history or music or chemistry or whatever class it may be, that the Lord will increase a hundredfold your understanding and your memory. We don't want to study like the rest of the world. Be sure that prayer is in with your study and you'll see the Lord multiply a hundredfold over what's happening to you. Second suggestion. Again, I'm sure I won't tell you anything new today. I just hope to be able to quicken your conscience that you'll be sure to do it. The second one is to read in the scriptures. President Benson's committed us all through the Spirit to read in the Book of Mormon every day. And I would hope and pray there wouldn't be anyone in this audience that either has, is not doing it or is committed to do so. And we're not talking, I know when you're studying, I re it wasn't too long ago I was in those chairs out there, and I know there's a lot of reading to do, and it's difficult sometimes, but I promise you that if you would just commit even 5 or 10 or 15 minutes, whatever you can give, each day to reading in the passages, the Lord will begin to speak to you through those passages and greatly bless you for having given some time to still pondering the word of the Lord while you're in school. Now, I don't mean just in a religion class or something either. I'm talking about being alone, prayerfully reading the passages. There is great strength that will come to you if you do that. You'll find again that when you may have a tendency to be discouraged, you'll run a passage of scripture through your mind. It could be anyone that's special to you. And the moment you begin to do that, to have the words of the Lord come into your mind, any other spirit will leave and the spirit of the Lord will come. I just opened my book here and it fell open to section 76. For example, this is the end of the vision which we saw. This is the great vision of the celestial, terrestrial, celestial kingdoms. I'm reading verse 113, which we were commanded to write while we were yet in the spirit. So I think of that verse of scripture. What if Joseph Smith had not written down what he had seen in that great vision? We would have lost most of it. The Lord commanded him that while he was in the spirit to write it down. While you're in the spirit of this meeting, when you feel the spirit of the Lord witness in your heart during this meeting, some things you ought to do or maybe some things you ought to not do, write it down just as Joseph Smith did. Commit to put that in place. I think it's significant. He said, he commanded us we should not write some things while we're yet in the spirit that are not lawful for man to utter. You could take that verse or any one that was impressive to you, memorize it. When you're feeling a little discouraged, say it out loud. Make a note of that, not just to run it through your mind. Sometimes you're in a place where you can't say it out loud. <clears throat> but many times you can, and to the degree you can say it out loud, do it. And you'll chase away that spirit of discouragement that in truth is old scratch the devil himself trying to discourage you. I think of the opening verses of the Doctrine and Covenants. Hearken, O ye people of my church, my eyes are upon all men, and there is none to escape. There is no eye that shall not see, nor ear that shall not hear, nor heart that shall not be penetrated. The voice of warning is unto my people by the mouths of my disciples whom I have chosen in the last days. They'll go forth and none shall stay them, for I have commanded them. You memorize something that to you moves you inside. And when you're beginning to feel a little blue, say it out loud, and you'll chase away that spirit that would have you be discouraged. A 
a third one. Use good music. Use good music. Let me try to give you a couple of examples of what I mean by that. You have to realize, that, brothers and sisters, that in each of these things, Satan is mightily about trying to keep you from doing these things that we're mentioning. The evil spirit teacheth a man not to pray, but I command you to pray over all things. Look unto me in every thought, it says, doubt not, fear not. Again, that struggle. The devil saying, don't read the scriptures. You don't have time. They're too hard to understand. The Lord teaching us to prayerfully ponder the passages every day. Some don't realize when they talk of music that it's the same thing. There is the Lord's music. There is perhaps some good romantic music you may want to sing to your wife. I like to do that maybe just to make my wife laugh. <laughs> I'm not sure if she's laughing at the song or the singer, but she seems to like it. And I don't know, I would guess that thanks to her, because she's helped me a lot with that, I maybe know 20 or 30 songs for memory, just some romantic type things. If I loved you time and again, I would try to say maybe something like that. See what a poor singer he is? But if there are some songs like that, there may be some good cowboy song, but the greatest ones, of course, are the hymns of the church that instill the Spirit of the Lord in the one who's singing. And I might quickly add, there is music of the devil himself. And do not misunderstand that and try to count it or call it something else. It is music of the devil himself. I have come to mind an experience that happened to me a few years ago with a man whom I'm, I would, I'll name only to speak evil of what he was doing, not of the man. I would not want to be out of order in speaking evil of the man. I suspect there may almost not be anyone here that doesn't know the man. He's one of the fam most famous rock stars in all the world that I spent two and a half hours with on a plane proselyting him. And his name is Mick Jagger in the Rolling Stones. How many know who Mick Jagger is? I know some of these older fellows over here don't. <laughs> but most did. <laughs> Well, when I got on the plane with this fellow, I didn't recognize him right off. And again, I'll just have to tell you this story in, in great brevity because I had two and a half hours with him and it was an interesting experience. I didn't recognize him right off, first thing. I told him I was an elder in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Who are you? And he told me Mick Jagger. And I said, well, I'm glad to meet you too. <laughs> and he was kind of a proudful fellow. And I'm not speaking again of the man, but of what he was doing. And he told me his name again, and I said, well, I'm glad to meet you, Mick. And it still didn't totally dawn on me. I just wasn't expecting to see him there. And then he opened up this big magazine he was reading with all these wild-eyed faces and very scantily dressed women, to say the least, and said, that's me. And, of course, I recognized immediately who he was. We began talking. I told him, I have opportunity over the years to be with many young people all over the world. I'm interested in a question you could answer for me. He said, well, what is it? I said, some of the young people I'm with tell me that <clears throat> rock music, the kind you and others are involved in, has no real impact on them. For good or for evil, it has no real impact. And others claim that it really does have a bad impact on them. You've been in this thing for 20 years. I'd like to know, what's your opinion? These were his exact words, brothers and sisters, an exact quote. He said, our music is calculated to drive the kids to sex. I was pretty much floored. I'm sure I must have shown it on my face. And then he kind of rebounded a little bit and he says, of course, it's up to them what they do. It's not my fault. I'm just earning a lot of money. And as the conversation proceeded, and again, there's not time to tell you all, even a small part of it. He was delighted at the fact, in his mind, the family was being destroyed around the world. Told him I had eight children. He told me he had some too, but no wives. Told me he had a woman pregnant in Virginia, another one in New York, and one in England. Told me he'd had the missionary lessons, some of them. I didn't believe that in the beginning in England, is where he said, but as I questioned him further, I think he was telling the truth. After he'd had three or four drinks, he said quite loudly in the cabin, Anybody that believes the Book of Mormon to be the Word of God is a liar. And the Book of Mormon is a lie. 
And I remember as you would have done, prayerfully thinking in my heart, what shall I say? How can I respond to that? I remember saying something like this back to him, Mick, you are mighty fortunate today. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, because you're sitting next to a servant of the Lord who's going to correct what you just said. Because it isn't true. And he said, what are you talking about? And I said, I happen to have a book of Mormon in my briefcase. And I pulled one out and laid it on his lap. I think because of maybe the drinking, and he also looked sick physically. The book was going about like that on his lap. And I said to him, I must have missed that chapter because I read this book many times and I believe it to be the Word of God. And if there is such a chapter, I want to see it. Of course, there was dead silence. He couldn't say a word. And I said, well, then how about one page? How about one paragraph? How about one line? How about one word? Mick, I bear testimony. You're the liar. The Book of Mormon is the Word of God. And I told him the best I could. The Lord would hold him responsible for his acts to the degree he understood what he was doing if he didn't turn his life around. Now it's evidence from the following years that followed that he didn't listen. But that doesn't change anything because that day on the plane he lied about this book. And I vowed to myself, and I'm thankful my family have abided by it, that we would never have any of that music in our home or anything like unto it. We've been blessed that way as a family. If you maybe have misjudged music or thought perhaps it wasn't that bad, believe the brethren. I bear witness to you again. There is good music in the world, the classical things, some of these romantic songs that I said I like, some of the old cowboy songs I like to sing and again make my family laugh. I love to sing the hymns more of all, most of all because they bring the Spirit of the Lord to me. And when I'm discouraged or not feeling up, all I've got to do is be exposed a little bit to some of that great music from the hymns of the Church, and the Spirit of the Lord seems to descend upon me and will upon you. The key is your gathering, brothers and sisters, in this pattern is not wait till you're discouraged to pray, read the scriptures, and sing. And the last one I'll mention in a minute. But to do those is a matter of course in your life. I can't think of anything be more fun present than to be able to hear all these young people in their dorms and in the showers singing away in the morning. I think that'd be a great thing. How many of you have a habit when you get up in the shower or some other place to sing to start the day off? Raise your hand high, would you? Okay, maybe 20%. The rest of you repent <laughs> and start doing it. Because you'll find if you'll get in the practice and just memorizing the words to some of the hymns will give you great power. I'm not, I can't think, I always have a blank when I try to think of the words in front of a group like this, but, and I'm not sure I can even remember them. Maybe you can help me, somebody back here. But think of these simple words for some of you, for example, who have not gone to the temple or some who are thinking to go. I love to see the temple. I'm going there someday. How does the rest go help me? <laughs> I told you, I kind of forget when I get up here. What's the next part? To feel the Holy Spirit, to listen and to pray, for the temple is a holy place, a place of love and beauty. As a child of God, I've learned this truth. A family is forever. That's not part of it, is it? That's the other song. <laughs> well, I told you I'm not a very good singer, but it will bring the Spirit to you. Okay? I am a child of God because I have been given much, a poor wayfaring man of grief. You pick one you love, and if you're in a place you can't sing it out loud, sing it inside, inside, but try to find a place where you can sing it out loud with the power of the Lord, and you will find the Spirit of the Lord will come to you, and discouragement will flee. Remember the key being to do it every day. Get up in the morning and sing, You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. Whatever you want, it will get your mind and your heart directed towards things that are good and right and holy, and you'll be on your way. The fourth and last one is to serve other people, to forget self, to go out and try to help someone else. And if you will do that, you'll find discouragement will flee you. 
I can't help but think of the greatest example in Christ. That seemed to be all he wanted to do, was to go out and minister to the needs of others. And I'm sure in the process strengthened himself by having given. You will never ever give anything to the Lord, my brothers and sisters, that he will not multiply a hundredfold and more back to you. Go out and love the people. When you see someone a little discouraged in one of the dorms or somebody that's sitting alone in a class, sometimes nothing more than just going over and put your arm around him or say, Come on, John or Jill, how's it going? Maybe that's all they need. Maybe it's just a smile in the hallway. Maybe it's more going in their dorm with them, say with another young man, if it were me doing this, or with a companion, with a female, and have a word of prayer together. Maybe it's seeking a priesthood blessing. If you're struggling with some problem right now, do not be hesitant to go to the bishop or someone else you have confidence in and ask for a priesthood blessing. Because I bear witness to you again, if you will do those simple things, the Spirit of the Lord will abide upon you and discouragement will flee. And if you learn how to do it on a daily basis, and that's why we tell the missionaries that little white Bible they carry around on their mission with all the rules, if they will learn how to abide by those principles all their life, maybe all of them except about the opposite sex, we want them to come home and get married. But if they'll follow the rest of the pattern, which is the one I'm describing to you in truth, you'll learn how to chase discouragement far from you. Let me give maybe just one last example. So I think about giving to other people. We're in a great moment right now, just having finished Thanksgiving and about to descend upon us Christmas to search for some ways to perhaps extend ourselves further in giving of ourselves to other people. Think for just a moment of these key questions that I'll ask and answer and try to do it in just a minute. Where did Jesus seem to like to spend his time? With the poor, with the needy, with the downcast, the downtrodden, even with an adulteress who he sent on her way full of hope. When did he do it? Oh, it seemed to be about all the time, but many times the greatest things happened on the way to a miracle. They happened on the way to something, and we find that in our lives. Many of the greatest things will happen to you, it may not be in your plan. You have to respond on the way to somewhere to see that kind of a miracle. How did he do it? What did he give? I don't have time to address those questions, but he gave mostly of himself. He gave these spiritual things we're talking about that buoyed the people up, that strengthened them, that turned them to the Lord, as I hope you'll feel turned more to the Lord in having been here today. Let me tell you of just one last example, perhaps, that occurred to our family about a month or two ago. We decided on our Monday activity nights for activities that instead of entertaining ourselves or doing things like that, that a good part of the time, not always, but a good part of the time would be spent in going out to surprise someone, either anonymously or otherwise if you have to. We were in a rest home about a month or so ago and had a tremendous experience. We went up to the head matron, said to her, here's this family of, I guess there were eight of us maybe that were there of the ten that night, and we said to them, would you give us the name of two or three people we could visit tonight that might be just kind of discouraged or down? And I could see in this woman's face written a hundred names. She could have given us a list of a hundred without doubt. But she gave us two or three. She gave us the name of one lady, Joyce, and another, Louise, a German lady. We went into their room to visit them, both in their 70s. Joyce was laying prone in the bed, couldn't even lift her head. We talked to them about their families. We told them that we were there just to express our love to them. They were surprised, almost like we must have had some other agenda or some other reason for being there, other than just loving them. But as they sensed, it was genuine, that it was just true love, that there was no other agenda that we just cared. You could feel the Spirit of the Lord begin to fill that room and fill their hearts. After we'd visited five or ten minutes, I said to them, how about if we sing you a song before we leave? I think my wife inspired, I was thinking of a church hymn. She's the one who said, let's sing them, You Are My Sunshine. And as a family we stood there and, You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. We begin to see the tears just course down the cheeks of these two ladies. Joyce was so touched by it, she sat up in bed. She got out of bed. She came over to embrace us before we left. I asked Eloise if she sang. She said, I sing German lullabies. 
She sang a beautiful lullaby for us before we left. People gathered in the hall to see what was going on. I saw my wife on her knees, holding hands with a woman who could not speak a word. And yet a tremendous conversation going on just in their grip. I thought to myself, if I've ever seen an angel, I see one now. And as we walked out, my son and I turned around and over in the dark saw another woman in a wheelchair. I said, honey, so I must just go say something to this lady before we leave. We went over there and I said something like, without knowing her name, we just wanted to come by and say hello to you and tell you we love you. Is there anything we could do to be of help to you? This woman again, about in her 70s, said, I cannot hear a word you're saying. I'm stone dead. But thank you for noticing me. Thank you for noticing me. Oh, thank you for noticing me. Just three times in a row. Well, we stood there and wept with this woman as we just held her hand. And I couldn't help but think again of, we went to try to help. But that night, the Cook family are the ones who were really blessed. Perhaps more than those we tried to bless. How to get out of discouragement, that fourth one's a great one. Forget yourself. The Master said, lose yourself in my service and you'll find yourself. Brothers and sisters, I bear testimony to you in the name of the Lord. That the Lord wants us to be a happy people. Don't be discouraged if on occasion you're discouraged. It does us all good, I think, to on occasion have a discouraging day. It helps you know what it's like to have a good one. But I bear witness the Lord wants us to gain control over our bodies and our thoughts and our emotions and our feelings. And to the degree you do that with the Spirit of the Lord, I bear testimony the Spirit will buoy you up, will strengthen you and allow you to be able to extend love to others. And in the process, you will be blessed. I bear testimony these things are true, that if I had one message for you above all the others, it would be this. So listen carefully. I pray that you may be turned more to God, to love Him with all your heart, mind, and mind, and strength, because therein you will find true joy and happiness. And the second commandment is like unto it. If you want to really show that love, go out and do it to others. I bear testimony these things are true, and pray the Lord's choicest blessings upon each of you. I humbly pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.